little bit about Perl too. So I'm from both UCSD and CSU, and I've also been working with um, the Center for Central Modular Neuroengineering and ERC, funded by NSF, on a project that involves closed loop computer interfaces. They can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the great thing about closed loop brain computer interfaces is that they can be used to treat Parkinson's, depression, and spinal cord injury, some very debilitating neurological disorders. And what they do is they, they use stimulation, some type of electrical stimulation, to induce things like reanimation or neuroplasticity and sometimes pain inhibition, and then use ECOG to feedback to modulate the input signal. But the problem with this is the reason why we need neurotransmitter detection is that the mechanisms behind the the behind the stimulation are not fully understood. Uh, for example, a lot of people are using surface stimulation along the outside of the spinal cord or on the surface of the brain, and they don't actually know what neurons are stimulating. And they don't know what's happening over long term. So imagine if we're working with a Parkinson's patient and we stimulate at the surface, we don't know if we're actually stimulating dopaminergic neurons, but we get some change in the Parkinson's patient. Well, maybe there's some other mechanism other than the uh, stimulation of those neurons in the substantia nigra that causes the, the pathology. Another thing that we could do once we get neurotransmitter detection is it's possible that we could uh, use the, the, uh, the neurotransmitter detection to, to decode the ECOG signal itself by understanding what's actually going on at the neuron phase. So, the current technology that exists, there's already one um, that's used in, in humans called the WINGS device. Uh, the problem with this one is that it's too large and it's only a single site. So if we want to know what's going on multiple levels and multiple areas of the brain or the spinal cord, we can't use this device. The other problem is that if we want to look at it in, in animal models, it's too large for animal models, it's also too large for the spinal cord. Uh, microdialysis is another option instead of fast scan CV or the WINGS device. And this one is not good for any, any real-time detection and thus requires animal sacrifice in order to understand the neurotransmitters that are uh, being transmitted during the, the stimulation. And there are current electrode arrays that could possibly be implemented for this same process, but the problem is they're, they're, we need different sizes for our input and output in order to get good electrochemical signals. And the, generally, we need penetrating ones that go closer to where our cell bodies are and go get closer to LFPs and single neuron units, but these are very rigid at the base, which is not very good for long-term implants. And the ones that are very flexible tend to be surface, surface electrodes, which aren't good for neurotransmitter detection. So what we want are doing is we're making glassy carbon arrays. And to make these arrays, first we start off with just a simple uh, SiO2 wafer and coat it with this polymer. Um, SU8. This is an epoxy that cross-links under UV light, and we pattern it however we want. And then, under a simple process called pyrolysis, we get our little carbon features. Well, um, what happens when we do this pyrolysis? As we increase the pyrolysis temperature, we get uh, a loss of oxygen and a loss of hydroxyl groups, and an increase in order which is in a decrease in lattice size which is indicative of some sp2 orbitals. And the great thing about sp2 orbitals is that we get low impedance, which means we have a conductive electrode. And once we have these electrodes, we run a quick, fat, quick um, cyclic voltometry. We can find out the electron transfer rate, which is comparable to gold, and thus can be used for real-time detection because we can detect oxidation and reductions very quickly. Um, so the benefit of what we call GCMEMS, or glassy carbon MEMS, is that we get to start off with whatever shape we want and pyrolyze it and end up with patternable, low impedance, and fast electron transfer electrodes. But now we still have this problem of the electrodes being on a stiff silicone substrate. And so we had to come up with a way to put it on a more flexible substrate. And what we did is we just coated it with polyamide, another photo, one with a photo initiator to make it photosensitive, pattern it, and then, rather than using carbon traces that we could also pattern, we decided to use metal traces that would flex a little bit better with the material, pattern those, 
and then put our final insulation layer and then just lift off the substrate. And this is what we end up with. We have flexible uh, glassy carbon uh, electrodes, which you can see in each one of these devices. This one's very close up with the metal trace behind it that with the, when encased in polyamide has a very good tensile strength, but is still fairly flexible. Uh, so we've also used this with the help of people at, uh, in the neuroscience partner with Tim Genter's lab, we were able to detect some ECOG just to be sure that we can use this for ECOG detection. So this is some raw ECOG data. And then this is an audio stimulus that applied and found that we could get um, some relationships with the general ECOG data where in, during quiet time we have uh, higher counts of low frequency. And then when the stimulation occurs, we have higher counts of higher frequency indicating that this is true ECOM data, not just noise, and so we've proven that. But now we need to be able to get the electrochemistry in order to determine no transmitter detection. So first, we wanted to compare, just make sure our system is stable, so we do it in a regular electrochemical cell and run, just run an electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, and this just shows that the, the impedance is fairly low and the system is very stable. And then we want to bring it into a smaller a smaller system because what we want is we want to use this platinum electrode, a larger electrode, as our <coughs> counter. What is the electrode that is going to be input into the system? And we see that we're able to get something very similar, just differences in phases and impedance that would account for just using a smaller cell volume. And finally, we also did the same, the same experiment. This one is with the platinum electrode. Them carbon to carbon, we get a very similar input. So now we do 5-HT um, or serotonin detection. And this is fast scan CV, or fast scan cyclic voltometry. You run it about 100 volts per second. So we don't see much when we look at it directly. But as soon as we look up a little closely, we can see some of it. But the best thing we can do is actually do a background subtraction and see a uh, detection of um, serotonin at 0.7 volts, which is what's expected. And even though we, we have some noise from um, other ions, we still know that this portion is serotonin. Uh, so what we have now are uh, flexible microelectrocarbon arrays that can detect EGOG and can detect neurotransmitters. And so the next step is to really use in vivo work, make a penetrating design that we can put into animals. And last thing, what all of these graphs are about, is a way of um, functionalizing our carbon surfaces, uh, which occurs naturally after just a simple plasma etch uh, by immobilizing enzymes, and then being able to detect non-electroactive neurotransmitters such as GABA or glutamate. Thank you to a lot of people at SDSU, Tim Gunter's lab, and uh, the SDSU Nomen. Any questions? Yeah, so we are we want to make the electrodes themselves stiff, but the idea is that the backing of the electrodes is, needs to be flexible because it has to move with the spinal cord or with the cortex. So the what part that penetrates will be stiff, but the backing would be flexible. Okay. And so we're actually thinking about interfacing with also elastomers that to make it even more flexible, but um, using something stiffer just to penetrate. Uh, not yet, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's one of the things that we're trying to find out right now is how sensitive and how specific we can make it. Um, I imagine that we could use some type of enzymes or immobilization rather to get something a little bit more sensitive if necessary. What was the concentration of serotonin? Oh, that was um, three micromolar. Yeah, so it, it ranges around um, between 1 to 10 micromolar, so that's what I try to keep it at. So at least we can detect it that, but if it's lower, we would like to go a little bit lower. So I still need to figure out how low we can go. All right, let's thank our speaker again.